Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, True Crime with Jess Rose. Hope you're all doing okay out there. Um, if you're watching from America, oh my god, it's catching my eye. I've actually got it on the telly at the moment. Um, I wouldn't like to be you like, at the minute. I genuinely wouldn't, no matter what side you, you, you fall under. It just must be a nightmare. Look, just tender hooks waiting to see what way it's going to go so i wish you all good luck Re obviously regardless of which way you've uh you've swayed um so i'm going to take him on off it for half an hour um before i do thank you to all my new subscribers and obviously comments i've been getting and likes now i did get a comment um quite recently and the lady who commented, um, she she wrote something really lovely originally. It was on the Gabriel Fernandez story. Um, and it was a lovely comment, very really kind. Um, but then she said she re-watched the story that I'd done. And she thought perhaps I'd gone a little bit too hard on the teacher who was involved in Gabriel's life. Um <sighs> I'm still torn, but like she says, you know, if she'd have took Gabriel home with her, you know, it would have been a kidnapping charge. So, you know, I understand her, her hands were tied. And I think because he was such a gorgeous little boy, and he was a little boy, I think emotions run a little bit higher. Um, so it's easy to throw out flippant comments like, I'd take him, you know, without obviously... Um, getting into the logistics of all of that, um, you know, how that would work. So I suppose I did go in a little bit too much on the teacher, maybe. You know, I have always said in these stories, regardless of what authorities are involved and what family members are involved in any of the cases I do, the fact remains that the people who have died, who I'm doing the stories about, it's the person killed them is a hundred percent to blame you know because without them doing that we wouldn't be talking about it you know so i do stick to that they're a hundred percent to blame i do throw in my own opinions now and again and i do state they are only my opinions um so yeah um to that lady thank you for your comment i do understand where you're coming from it probably was a bit harsh on the teacher but like I say, I'd not long watched the documentary. I did know about the case back when it happened. Um, you know, and the teacher was interviewed then. And I felt the same then at the same time. But like I say, I, how I wasn't in that position. It wasn't me there. So, yeah, I don't know what else I can say to that. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a very emotional story. And... You know, to try and put yourself in their shoes. It does, I suppose, it's impossible. So, yeah, please keep watching um, to that lady. Um, you know, I do throw my opinions in, but I think that's how the world works. You know, we've all got differences of opinions, and I think we just talk them out or we agree to disagree. It really is that simple. Um, so, t today's story, tonight's story... Um, I'm doing it from a show I've done before and it's Faking It Tears of a Crime. I love this show because it um, obviously shows the story to begin with and then moves on to three professionals who one can um, spot uh, physical uh, movements in a perpetrator and spot they've done something like, uh, what's it called now? It's called um, oh, a, a sleep. A slip. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. Can't think of the name now. A, 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 oh, if you can think of it, put it in the comments. It's a gestural slip. Gestural slip, and it's just basically where your shoulder can move or your head will shake. No, as you're telling a story, so your body basically contradicts what you're saying, and it's unconscious. You don't know it's happening. Uh, you got another lady who can. Uh, she more goes with the language they're using, tones they're using. And then you've got um, a lady, Kerry Dane, she's the profiler. Uh, she's a little bit like Emma Kenny from Britain's Darkest Taboos. It's a really, really interesting programme. Now, 
this gentleman, his name's John Tanner, and I'd seen the story. I'm shouting. I feel like I'm being really loud. I'm sorry if you've got to turn it down. I've got loud. I think I'm going deaf. I think that might be the problem. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so if you need to turn me down, I understand. Now, like I say, I'd seen this story on Faking It Teaser for Crime, and um, I haven't done it. And a fourth series came out. I was very excited. If you're a true crime fan, when a new series of a show that you enjoy watching comes out, it's, it's really sad, but it's so exciting. You're like, yes, because I know these stories. I want to know what's happening. So a series four came out, and this gentleman was mentioned again. Now, he was originally from series one. They'd um, analysed him and stuff. And then I seen him in series four. And I was like, ooh, it's not like them to mess up like that. You know, thinking they'd re-repeat, you know, repeated the story. But they hadn't. And I'm going to tell you now exactly why he's in series one and series four. Now, we go back to 1989. Um, we do come back up to date, but we go back to 1989 and there's a gorgeous girl called Rachel McLean, 18 years old. Uh, she's from Blackpool originally. Uh, now Rachel's a very hard worker, really focused on her studies. Supposed to be a very outgoing, bubbly, lovely, lovely girl. Um, like I say, very pretty everything to live for and she studied so hard she got to go to Oxford University I mean it's it's stuff of dreams for your children isn't it to go to such a prestigious university it'd be like oh my god you've made it kind of thing um so at 18 like I say she goes she's in Oxford and she's studying very hard and life's going so well for Rachel McLean so well Family very proud of her. On her 19th birthday, she met a man called John Tanner. Now, John's only two years older. He's 21. Now, he's a British-born British New Zealander. So, obviously, born here must have moved over when he was very, very young. But he'd come back to do his studies at an, um, a university in Nottingham. So, it's 100 miles away from Rachel, but they met... And I think it was at a party. Um, I'm not too sure how that works. Log like, site's 100 miles away, but it's just said they met and they clicked. Um, and they made it work. That's a big distance, but they made it work. And it was really sweet because there's a lot of love letters between them. Very articulate love letters, not like big hearts and sealed with a loving kiss. None of that. Just very um like I say articulate notes to each other just expressing so many different ways of expressing their love for one another it was like oh my god to me it'd be like love you but um yeah so th this is how they made it work with between letters and phone calls and and obviously visiting each other but um after a few months Rachel started to have second thoughts about the relationship I don't think it was the distance I think she was the type of girl that would have made that work she started finding he was a bit possessive started getting quite controlling wanted to know where she was you know she didn't answer the phone don't forget why be before mobile so if she wasn't in to answer the house phone he was questioning where she was you know and after a few months that's I mean that's not wrong it anyway as we know but after a few months, you think he'd keep it hidden a little bit longer. Um, so she was getting quite irritated by John at this point. Don't forget, she's only young. She's only 19. She's got everything. To, he's only 21. Um, but he was a very intense guy. Looks very well spoken as well. Very intelligent, but very intense. Um, so whereas she was looking at calling this relationship... He started talking about marriage. Now, I think no matter how close you are, after a couple of months, that's a little bit like, whoa, let's, let's slow this down a little bit. Um, 
Now, we get to February 1991. So they've been together a little while now. Um, and she writes him a beautiful Valentine's card. This is all found after the fact. And it is, it is an amazing um, Valentine's card. Like I say, it's just... It's so intricate in the wording. It's just like the fires within me burn for you. Look, very poetic and just a lovely card. But... Rachel also had a diary. She sent this card to John. At the, on the same day, she wrote in her diary, just basically saying, you know, I've had to spew off the same amount of dribble to him, you know, just to keep him happy. She just, this girl just wasn't happy and her true feelings came across in her diary. Um, so... It's obviously the writing was on the cards for these two. I don't think John... Mind you, if she's sending cards like that, I suppose he wouldn't get the hint, would he? Maybe she thought it would just phase out because of the distance. I'm not too sure. But in April 1991, don't forget that was only February. So April 1991, Rachel doesn't turn up for an exam. At uni and this is very unusual because she's very focused so I heard that you know her teachers are like something wrong here um so she's reported missing right at least after they'd obviously got in touch with family no one had heard from her um the police go round to her house which she has got um housemates that she lives with uh no one's seen her they went away for the weekend her housemates did that that previous weekend before she I think she appeared missing on the Monday um and they've been away that weekend so they couldn't even say when she'd gone where she'd gone they just didn't know um but all her stuff was still at the house there was no sign that she'd packed up and moved anywhere which she wouldn't have done anyway it's just all, her life was there um so appeals uh, put out by the family there's posters there's searches you know everyone's beside themselves looking for this young girl um but the police were looking straight at john they didn't really look at anybody else he, there was two major factors he was one of the closest people to her you know where normally a search would start and he was the last person to see her now, what he said, he said he did visit her that, that weekend because the housemates were away. He spent the weekend with her. Um, then they got on a bus at the end of the weekend um, to the train station, which is a normal practice for them. She sees him off on the train. Um, and when he got on the train, he told the police he wrote a letter to her and... Um, and he said, he said, while they were at the train station, just waiting, having a coffee, um, a friend of Rachel's turned up, a male friend. Now, let's remember, John's quite possessive. He's quite controlling. But a male friend turned up, this mystery male friend that John didn't particularly know, and offered Rachel a lift home. John gets on the train. And he goes back to Nottingham. This is why he tells the police. The letter he um, said he was writing to her on the train. It does come to Rachel's house four days later. And obviously it's opened. And it says the same thing. It's really hammed up. Like this is a... Now like I said, their letters are very intricate. And they're really well written. But this was... Beyond that, it was, do you know how much I love you? You don't realise how much I love you. I'm sorry if this writing's a little bit, um, not not my normal neat writing. It's because the train's a bit bumpy. Um, wasn't it lucky that we bumped into that friend of yours who offered you a lift home? Who writes like that? Who, who put that? Especially someone who is possessive and controlling. You know, he'd just wave his girlfriend off with some mystery man that he doesn't know. 
it just didn't make any sense. Um, now, Rachel, at this point, is missing for 15 days. So we're over the two-week mark now. Her family is losing their mind looking for their daughter. Um, so what the police do, they arrange a press appeal with John. Now, they had no evidence on him, but they knew, they knew he had something to do with Rachel's disappearance. Don't forget, she's still only missing at the moment. Um, so they do this press conference, but they speak to the press beforehand. I have heard this done a couple of times in a couple of the stories I've done. And they put to the press, ask him hard questions, you know, going do what you need to do and they'll sit back and gauge his reaction um and you do see the press conference and he's so cocky he's just he might as well have just been sitting like this just watching the world go boy just very cocky um and that's hey, right roy do do you know or have you had anything to do with Rachel? and he's like not that i'm aware of no do you think she's still alive? I'd like to think so. It's all very, um, just arrogant. Just, he's just a very dislikable guy. Just when you watch it, it's just, it just makes you kind of cringe a little bit. Um, then he goes a step further. He, there's a reconstruction. A reconstruction of them walking into the train station so they get off the bus and the person playing Rachel is actually a WPC and she says because she's interviewed on uh, Faking It Tears of a Crime and she says you know he was very charming he was very chatty she thought you know he didn't come across as someone who was involved but at the same time he he wasn't the um heartbroken boyfriend either and they do this reconstruction of him walking through the train station with that kind of arm in arm just to try and jog people's memories of obviously seeing him and she wore a wig to look like Rachel. And this was his undoing. This uh, His cockiness, it, it came before a fall. Um, because a lady was watching at home and she recognises John. And she phones in and she says, I recognise, I do recognise that lad. But he wasn't with anyone. I was sat beside him. But he wasn't with anyone. But one thing I did notice while I was sat beside him, he was writing a letter on like thinly lined, very nice paper. Remember the letter? That he wrote on the winding train home. Rachel wasn't with him. Then they checked the buses. Um, now, the buses wasn't, they didn't, I don't think they had the cameras then, don't forget. 90, no, it was, it was 91, I think there was cameras. But there was a way to trace who got on the bus. Um, and they, they found John getting on the bus to the train station, but uh, alone. There was no record of anyone getting on with him. So... He was bang to roll. It's no sign of Rachel on the bus. There's no, certainly no, through eyewitness, uh, you know, accounts as well. There's no sign of Rachel at the train station. Um, you know, and then obviously him writing the letter while sat next to this woman. Obviously not a coincidence. So they pull John in, put all this to him, and he breaks. He didn't even take my trip. But I suppose... You know, he's been outed as a lawyer. You're a lawyer. She wasn't with you. Um, and he confesses. He killed Rachel the weekend he came to visit. Now, basically, he says... Now, there's no proof of this. He says that he'd proposed to Rachel and she'd accepted it that weekend. Um... Now, we know through the, her diaries, and obviously the police by that point knew, that there was no way this girl was going to accept a marriage proposal from him. She she wanted out of the relationship. Um, and that's obviously where that went, because he 
claimed that it was extreme provocation because after saying yes, she would marry him, then she says no. She pulled it back. It's all very odd. Um, now, he strangled Rachel with his bare hands um, and rolled her up in a carpet and hid her under the floorboards of the house she lived in. So she'd been there the whole time, which to me just, it, it, it was that stomach drop. I mention it every video, there's always a part where it's like, oh. And she was there when the police were there, when the housemates were there, she, she was there it, under a little, I think she was in a cupboard and there was like a, a where a hoover was kept and floorboards and he, he, he put her under there. And yeah, he, he tried to, well, he pled not guilty because again, like I say, he said it was extreme provocation and he just snapped. And Kerry Danes, she's got no time for that whatsoever, who's the professional on the show. And she just says, you know, it's hard to believe with these men that they're just the, the salt of the earth the day beforehand and all of a sudden, you know, it didn't work either because he was saying he just snapped. He didn't know what he was doing. But it was proven that not only had he strangled her with his bare hands, he then got a towel and tightened it, obviously, to make sure Rachel was dead. Poor girl. She was 19 years old. Um, so the, the jury obviously didn't, didn't buy into this at all. Um, and he was found guilty. Now, his sentence was life, apparently. Now, as we know here, that doesn't mean life at all. Um, so, that was in 91, and John Tanner was released in 2003 after serving just 12 years. 12 years for taking away a young girl's life for nothing, again, because she didn't want to be with him. There's how many stories have I done now where it's not just Maya. We've done uh, Christine Skur Skura. I can never pronounce that name. But when people are just, they can't get their head around that someone doesn't want to be with them. And the only answer they've got is, well, if I can't have you, no one's having you. It just, oh, it just sends me off. Um, so we fast forward 15 years now from John's release in 2003 up to 2018. Now, when John got released, he left England and he went back to New Zealand. Do you remember I said he was born here, but his family lived in New Zealand and he went back. And the reason we know all of this is because, remember I said he'd been in series one, of faking it tears of a crime and then I seen him. There he is in series four. Because John was up in court for he he hadn't killed the lady very close to his new girlfriend he'd beaten over a period of two days. Um and nearly killed her. He hadn't changed. He looked a bit different because in 91, he'd had like this kind of very student-y long hair. Um, you know, just a very young, young lad. Obviously, now we fast forwarded. He's in, I think he's in his 40s. Where are we going? I think he's in his 40s. Um, freshly shaven, hair cut, very different looking. Um, and it was said that he'd learnt from his previous time in England of how cocky he'd been. So in the dock, you see it, you see him in the dock, he doesn't move, he's kind of in a me meditative state, I think the word is. He doesn't move, he hardly blinks, he doesn't talk. He, it's like he learnt his lesson from the past and he wasn't going to incriminate himself anymore. Um, Here's the real one, the real thing that kind of like, just bothered me about this. His girlfriend, 
who he'd beaten over two days, who is alive. By the look of a, you know, just by look, because we know what he's capable of, she done a statement for him and says that, you know, he's a really nice guy and he just lost his temper and she didn't want him to get into too much trouble. You know, he'd said that, um, you know, we certainly shouldn't blame the women in these situations. Um, and Kerry Zanes is right. You should, there shouldn't be any blame. And I'm not blaming him. I'm just confused at her decision to do that. Um, but like Kerry said, Kerry Dane says it's it's not the girlfriend's fault. It's his fault. Why didn't he stop? It's his fault. Why is he still doing this? He murdered a girl. A young girl. He never should have been out in the first place. So, like I say, she speaks very highly of him. Um... And John's sentence, he gets two years and nine months. Now, if John, if John had done that in England, because he'd got a life sentence um, for the murder of Rachel, if he'd done that here, he would have automatically gone back to prison to do his life sentence. But because he's in New Zealand... New Zealand decided not to acknowledge. They knew, but they decided because he hadn't committed any crimes in New Zealand, they weren't going to make the jury or include his previous crime of murder in the UK. So, yeah, two years and nine months. Um, right, and Rachel's murder was, just wasn't considered a factor. Is that me? Is that, is that... It's just blown my brain, this has, because like I said, I knew, I knew about Rachel McLean, and I'd, I'd watched that story, and I was disgusted by it, um, and it was a story I was going to do, and then, like I say, the fourth series has come out. I've got very, like, excited thinking, you know, let's have a look and see what stories are on there that I can share with yourselves, which there are quite a few, but this one stood out because... He's, he's done it again. I mean, she just, by the skin of her teeth, it sounds like she's she's managed to get away alive. Now, I don't know if she's stuck by him while he's in prison. I've had a look. Um, it doesn't mention anything about her, but it does say he tried to get parole in 2019, claiming that um, any help he needs to get, he can get on the outside, he doesn't need to be in prison to get the help, but that was turned down. So he is still in prison. Um, I'm presuming he'll be out. Mind you, we're in November now, so we're probably going into next year now, but he will be out. So it's only a matter of time. He obviously hasn't changed. Maybe he's got a slight, slight bit more control than he had at 21. But his, um, his possessiveness and his aggression, it's obviously still all there. It, nothing changed. It wasn't just a, a one-off rage like Kerry said. It, it's not just a snap. It's got to be in you to do that anyway. It's not just, oh, I've snapped and I'm going to kill my girlfriend because she wants to leave me. It's it's there. It's there anyway. It's a, it's an escalation of that, and that that's that's going to be the outcome. I just oh, just stay away from this guy. It's only a matter of time before he does it again. And the fact that they knew what he'd done in England, what he's capable of still doing in a completely different country, and. Two years and nine months he got. Oh, it's just... I'll keep you posted on that because I've got a real feeling that's not the last we're going to hear of John Tanner. I, I really do. I think we're not going to hear... That, that's not going to be the last we're going to hear from him. Obviously, you know, there's still women that 
don't know. You see, you wouldn't know. I mean, I can't say. Maybe you should in this day and age. I can't say I've ever Googled somebody to see if they've ever had that history. I think maybe you need to in this day and age, don't you? Or maybe his, his girlfriend in New Zealand knew. Maybe she thought, oh, it won't happen to me. It's been a long time. He's changed. I just don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. I mean, he's not going to change. He's not going to change now. I mean, I was just trying to work out his age in 91. 89, he was 21. He'll be, in, I'm, I'm sure he's in his 50s now. He's not going to change. So, just stay away, ladies. Stay away. There's so many more men out there. Let's just stay away from the ones who've killed their partners before. Let's just try and... There's plenty more out there. Just my opinion. Don't come at me. Um, but, yeah, that's the story of John Tanner and Rachel McLean. I think I might do the title of Rachel McLean because I have said before I hate doing a title on the perpetrator. But because he's done it to us, I think, I think I'll do it as the Rachel McLean slash John Tanner story. That's how I'm going to do it. You'll know anyway because if, you've, if you're watching this story, that's what I've already done. I'm just... Thinking out loud as I do. And I'm still talking really loud. I've got to get these ears checked. Um, thank you again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Like I say, I have unlimited data now. So I'm going to be coming at you quite often now. So thank you again for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I will um, see you soon. Please subscribe. I'm not going to do the jingle. Please subscribe and like or put a comment. There we go shoulders started again there we go and i'll see you all soon thank you so much thank you